it does. It works. Brilliant. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks, Laura and Benjamina, for organising this really important session here at TAG today. Um, my name's Louise Fowler. I'm a post-excavation manager at MOLA, Museum of London Archaeology. Um, that sounds like a very dry job title, but my job is basically to manage projects um, after the field work has happened. So the finds work, the analysis, the dissemination of results of archaeological field work that's taking place within the development-led de de development archaeology sector in England. Um, I'm a field archaeologist by background, and I've included this slide not as a kind of badge of honour in any way, um, but just to give you a sense of where I come from in my practice. Um, I'm Historically, I've been very concerned with excavating sites, putting together chronological narratives for those sites, and then disseminating the results of those archaeological projects. Um, and I think you know, the development-led archaeology sector in England accounts for the vast majority of archaeological work that takes place in England. Um, it's well established now within the planning frameworks that guide new developments. And increasingly, archaeologists are also working with developers during excavations to engage wider publics about the value of archaeology. London's Crossrail scheme had a free exhibition at the Museum of London Docklands, um, and there were TV programmes about the, work, the archaeology that was uncovered during the project. At smaller scale, uh, engagement might include site visits, tours, works with local schools, um, talks to local communities and archaeology societies and archaeology can also be harnessed in creative ways um, in placemaking projects to give new developments distinctive identities such as the reconstructed Temple of Mithras below Bloomberg's new European headquarters in the City of London um, and which is also accompanied by artworks throughout the building that help to give that, that development a kind of archaeological sense of place. Many members of the public that don't visit museums will also encounter archaeology through stories in the media generated by development-led archaeology projects. A Google search for news stories over the past week would bring up things like the Roman egg found on a site um, in Buckinghamshire. There was the wonderful Iron Age shield found in Yorkshire. Um, and anthropomorphic stone figurines from sites in Orkney. All of those are finds that were made during development-led projects. Um, but in spite of all of this, I think that for many people working in development-led archaeology, the concept of decolonisation is something that museums with collections that come from former colonies need to worry about. Um, and it's not really our problem. Um, it's about increasing diversity within the sector without recognising a need for structural changes. Colonialism seems to be something that happens somewhere else, and I want to you know, maybe question that and say that for a long time, post-colonial post writers have been questioning that and trying to think about a more nuanced understanding of place. Um, in 1991, the cultural theorist Stuart Hall put it like this in his paper on old and new identities and ethnicities. People like me who came to England in the 1950s have been there for centuries. Symbolically, we've been there for centuries. I was coming home. I'm the sugar at the bottom of the English cup of tea. I'm the sweet tooth, the sugar plantations that rotted generations of English children's teeth. There are thousands of others beside me that are, you know, the cup of tea itself. Because they don't grow it in Lancashire, you know. Not a single tea plantation exists within the United Kingdom. Might not be quite true, but I, anyway. There's one in Cornwall. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, this is the symbolisation of English identity. What does anybody in the world know about an English person except that they can't get through the day without a cup of tea? And where does it come from? Ceylon, Sri Lanka, India. There's no outside hint of history that is this, is, this is the outside history that's inside the history of the English. 
There's no <coughs> English history without this other history. The notion that identity has to do with people that look the same, feel the same, call themselves the same is nonsense. So the places that define who we are as a nation are not just inside the borders of England, whatever historic England might think. The local and the global are intimately linked together and Hall describes them as prisms for looking at the same thing. English identities emerge through our relationships with those that we define as other. <coughs> Elizabeth Edwards' concept of elsewhere is also useful here, I think. In her work on photographic archives that contain colonial material, Edwards found that holding institutions within Britain often deemed this material not to be of primary relevance because it often fell between departmental structures and was considered to be somebody else's area of expertise. She defines elsewhere as a spatial, temporal and disciplinary not here that makes it possible for these kinds of spatially and temporally comp complicated histories to be elided, slipped over and omitted from accounts. Elsewhere's are blind spots in our vision. And I think these critiques have real relevance for thinking about how archaeological remains are treated through the English planning system. I'd like to start now by outlining some of how the system works at present. Um, in England, this is. So the historic environment um, includes archaeological remains, but also buildings, landscapes, um, and <clears throat> everything really that's the product of interactions between people and places over time. But for the purposes of management and consideration in the planning system, heritage, oh, back. heritage assets are defined parts of the historic environment which can be given weight in planning decisions depending on their significance. Archaeological remains fall into two recognised categories of heritage assets designated assets that might include things like scheduled ancient monuments, things that are recognised and listed, um, and non-designated assets, which includes buried archaeological remains that we don't know about yet because we haven't found them. Um, significance can range from locally listed buildings to world heritage sites, setting up a kind of a scale uh, from the local to the global, in which international significance is equated with greater importance so in this way, significance reflects hierarchies of governmental control. Globally recognised heritage assets are considered to be the most important. Historic England give guidance um, on how to assess the significance of heritage assets. Um, there are four main values that are considered as part of how um, you can assess significance. There's evidential value, um, historical or associative value, aesthetic value and communal value. This comes um, from the document Conservation Principles, Policies and Guidance, which is um, it's quite old now, 2008. Um, and archaeological finds and records are considered part of the evidential value of a heritage asset. So they give information about places, basically. They're in a supporting role of um, providing more information about the past of an asset. Uh, since the guidance was published, there's been a recognition of a need for, for greater public benefit from development-led fieldwork. But I think this assumption about the value of excavated remains also makes its way into other guidance um, for commercial practice. Following an excavation, the archaeological contractor is usually required to produce a report called a post-excavation assessment and updated project design, which quantifies um, the results of the excavation and assesses the significance and potential for further work, makes a plan for dissemination of the results and archiving um, at a level agreed with local government curators and with the client. This staged workflow was first set out by English Heritage in Map 2, guidance which followed the introduction of PPG 16 in 1990. Assessment is carried out by archaeologists without wider consultation generally. Um, Map 2 asked archaeologists to consider carefully the contribution that finds made to the site's chronological narrative. 
finds that were considered to be residual, so older than the context they were found in, um, or contexts that were contaminated with later material, could usefully be omitted from plans for further study. Though MAP2 was replaced by new guidance in 2006, I think this assumption about the value of fines persists. Guidance from the Chartered Institute of Archaeologists advises um, an assessment of potential according to a hierarchical scale ranging from local um, to global linked to importance. Local archaeological guidance um, also provides advice on assessing the significance of excavated assemblages. In the City of London, we're asked to use these um, regional and national headings to structure our um, assessments. And in my experience, there's some confusion about this, because this isn't really assessing the value of or the significance of heritage assets. It's a slightly different thing. Um, and fines are... Um, you, you will often get reports from fine specialists coming back saying that particular vines have um, national, international significance. Um, but it's not according to this kind of value-laden hierarchy. It's because these vines form part of wider networks that might be of interest to scholars working at a national level or you know, internationally. Um, they're evidence of the lo these larger distributions. Um, and there can be some conflict or argument over how that assessment of significance takes place. Um, this sort of structure of things is also sort of filtering in to have an impact um, in museums as well. In London, um, Historic England are currently in discussions with the Museum of London for setting up a system whereby archives um, might be deposited, well, finds from excavations may be deposited depending on the significance of the site. So if the site is deemed to be of only very low significance, the finds might be omitted from the archive. Um, so it was partly as an opportunity to reflect on some of these um, structures within the system that I've been working with colleagues at MOLA and Dr. Sarah Malik from the University of Oxford to carry out a post-excavation assessment on a group of contemporary objects from, um, collected by a photographer, Gideon Mendel, um, from the site of the Calais jungle camp, which was demolished by the French police in October 2016. I should say Sarah's also been working with Dan um, the back of the room, uh, on an exhibition at the Pitt Rivers Museum um, about Calais and um, the jungle. Uh, the exhibition La Lande has finished, um, but there's a book as well, um, which is freely available online. So, yeah, small plug for you. <laughs> um, we've just completed the initial recording of the objects. We've recorded 2,181 um, items. Um, and I can just run through a few of the things that we've um, recorded. So the mo most Numerous objects by far were tear gas canister parts, um, which come um, from two different manufacturers in France. Um, one of the aspects of the objects that we really wanted to explore was any evidence for a kind of longer biography that might um, help us to think beyond the site where they were found. Um, these tear gas canisters have um, been reused in creative arts projects within the camp um, and used as plant holders. And some of them have names written on them as well. Um, some of the objects uh, have clearly traveled in some way to get to Calais. Um, this is a rail card, a travel card for Istanbul, um, and then a wallet there for um, Italy. Um, we don't know, of course, how these objects, particular objects, ended up in Calais exactly, although we might imagine. Um, it's a tin can of kidney beans, which comes from an English supermarket, um, with a wrapper with some perhaps Arabic writing on it um, stuck in the top. Um, it's a tin plate from an exhibition at the Royal Academy. 
a coat uh, that's marked up in English with allergen and blood type information. Uh, and a football shirt from a school in Germany. Um, these objects contain complex relationships um, or evidence for complex relationships that manifest at scales between local, national and global. In their book um, about Lalonde, Hicks and Mallet write about the temporal violence of the British border in Calais um, and how this manifests itself in an enforced sense of timelessness or limbo um, for migrants and refugees enacted through a denial of stability and permanence that's de degenerated since the demolition of the camp into a daily rhythm of regular and sustained evictions and confiscations inflicted by the French police. Temporal violence is also enacted through a failure to recognise the historical conditions of migration. Many of the countries from which people come to Calais were formerly protectorates or protected states of the British Empire. Um, places like Eritrea, Somalia, Sudan and Afghanistan. And to map this landscape, to understand it, uh, they write, requires a geotemporal rather than a purely situational account of La Lande. This image behind here is one that was taken by Gideon Mendel when he went back to the site um, of the camp um, a few months after the um, evictions. And similarly, I think Mendel's objects can't really be used to reconstruct a, history, a kind of archaeological history of the camp. Um, and neither would we want to do that. Um, the collection is essentially unstratified from a practical point of view, um, but we can still look at these things for evidence of wider social, political, economic systems by expanding our study of the finds temporally and spatially beyond the site where they were found. But within our current frameworks, it's not really very easy for us to do this with earlier archeological assemblages. Um, how does this collection fit into this framework for assessing significance? It was most recently physically situated within one nation state, France, and <coughs> deliberately moved to another, the UK, but it can't be understood at all without looking at the relationships between these countries and several more in Europe, Asia, and Africa. And it's questionable whether any are likely to be interested in seeing this assemblage as part of their nation's heritage. This collection has international significance, but in a way that cuts across national identities and challenges them. If we say that these kinds of relationships and aren't part of our subject of inquiry, what does that mean for the kinds of stories that we tell <laughs> and for the people who are interested in them? Um, so this is um, Cara Walker's amazing installation in the Tate at the moment, um, her response to the Victoria Monument. And I just want to say that we are kind of, we need to grapple with similar questions, um, even if we've got an uphill struggle ahead. The status quo has led to a lack of understanding about how um, people in Britain benefited from colonialism and empire. Part, I'm going to have to rush through the last bit because I'm running short, but um, partly it's enacted through this everyday evidence for wider connections becoming a kind of elsewhere um, that we can't, um, by focusing on creating this chronological narrative of place, we're missing these wider connections. Um, and this issue is closely linked to the language of the assessment of significance, which uses this spatial scale to assign levels of importance. Um, wider connections aren't well served by this system. There's loads of potential for us as development-led archaeologists to be studying this kind of thing. Colonial countryside, um, the project led by Corinne Fowler at the University of Leicester, working with National, Heritage, um, National Trust properties to explore colonial collect, um, connections is one great example. Um, and this is the legacies of British slave ownership project at UCL, which has created this amazing database. This is the, um, the addresses of people in Fitzrovia <coughs> who um, their addresses that are connected with claims for compensation on the abolition of slavery. Um, and so this is the area we're in right now. Um, you, there's loads of potential to link this up to archeological finds. Um, I think partly 
There's this um, temporal elsewhere as well, with much of the recent past becoming a kind of not our problem for development led archaeology. Um, and this also manifests itself as a way of, you know, by just focusing on this very historical <coughs> narrative, we don't look at the wider connections across time. So we don't think about how um, ideas about Romans, for example, also had an impact in the 18th, 19th century and you know, the architecture of the city, for example. Um, we don't think about how those conceptions kind of flow through time. And I think um, thirdly, we need to be aware of some of these histories to be glossed over um, in placemaking projects as well. Um, although this in particular site I think is probably an example of bad marketing, I don't think there were necessarily any archaeologists involved. This is a hoarding um, outside the Museum of London in Docklands. Um, it's a new tower that's going up there and um, they're linking this idea of sugar, West Indian prosperity to the current prosperity of the area with no mention of how that prosperity was created. Um, so, uh, in summary, I think we need to identify our elsewheres um, and really find out what matters to people, to communities um, as part of you know, the planning system is very difficult to navigate for people who don't know the language of that system. Um, Recognise where we have silences and gaps. Um, make present this, you know, understand how we benefited from colonialism and empire um, and move beyond these very historical chronological narratives. Okay, thank you. <laughs>